Well, I saw the hands raised for how many people are actually actively trading futures and options, so this should be really fun with swaps. <laughs> uh, the purpose of my, uh, my talk up here is going to really be to introduce our group, talk a little bit about Coke, um, and then to keep it simple, I'm going to show a couple examples of how a over-the-counter swap may work in the lumber industry. Um, they're just hypothetical, uh, hypothetical trades I'm going to put up here. So if there's any questions, you can stop me and go back and look at some of them, or you can catch me afterwards and after I've thoroughly confused you up here, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, so Coke pulp and paper trading <clears throat> is an indirect subsidiary of Coke Industries. And I think as I was writing this, um, Coke is the second largest privately held company in the United States, uh, 70,000 employees in the U.S. and about 120,000 <clears> worldwide. So we have a presence in over 60 countries. Um, you may have heard of some of our companies that we own, Georgia Pacific, Coke Fertilizer, Invista, which makes uh, Lycra and Spandex, um, Molex, if you have a cell phone out there, there's a good chance that some of your little switches and electronic devices are made by Molex, uh, Guardian, which makes glass, Coke Supply and Trading, uh, we have some ranching companies and a variety of other companies. So Coke Pulp and Paper has been at Coke for over 14 years. There's four of us. Three of the guys have been together for over 20 years. I joined in 2011, and as Phil said, I came from uh, Sherwood, and before that I was at Block Lumber. So everyone asks us, you know, when we talk about swaps at these events, like, what do you actually do? Uh, so we help companies manage exp exposure to price volatility. And we basically do it through over-the-counter swaps, which is a derivative. We're a counterparty to these. So we'll take risk out of our customers' books and put them into our own books. We're not brokers, wholesalers, agents, or consultants. We manage all the risk ourselves, um, and there's no brokerage fees or, uh, or costs associated with these transactions. So who uses us? Um, I put up here. I put up here a couple different, uh, a couple different people that may use us: pro dealers, uh, mills, secondary markets, multifamily, and components. So let's just pick one and talk about it. Component manufacturers uh, like to use our product, um, especially now uh, as multifamily has taken over and there's pricing that has to go out over 12 months in some cases. Um, we have a lot of component manufacturers that like to use us to lock in their pine, their southern pine, where they don't want to take the basis risk on it. And they do this through an over-the-counter swap. We have secondaries that want to use us because they want to lock inventory on the ground on very specific items. So this next chart we're going to talk about are different risk scenarios that Candace may have touched on a couple of these, and I'm sure Greg will touch on a couple of these uh, going forward. So you have, if you have an inventory as a wholesaler or a production as a mill, and you may want to lock the numbers in, what do you currently do right now? So there's the real easy one. You speculate. You outright go along the market. Hope you're right. Works out. It's great. If it doesn't work out, we all know the, uh, the results of that. I've been involved on both sides of those before. Sell forward. You have the future business, you buy a whole bunch of stuff and you put it on the ground. Uh, that's great, works out good as long as the customer stays in business, wants to take the inventory at the right time, and doesn't back out if the price changes. You can sell futures as Candace went over. Works out great, uh, especially when you're talking about two by four and some other items with high correlations. Uh, and you're willing to take the basis, roll risk, and the time risk. Or you can do a swap. Uh, and a swap basically takes a very specific risk in a specific time frame and volume and manages that over time. <clears throat> Forward pricing. This is the exact opposite side of the trade. Somebody wants you to go out and price them for 
anywhere from two months to, to a year long. How do you currently handle that? Current options, speculate. I mean, this is the multifamily model right now. Go out and take business over a whole year and hope when you go to buy it, it's a lot cheaper at that time. In a trending market, this uh, a bear market going down, it works out great. In a bull market, every time you go to buy your product, you're paying more money and losing money, potentially. You can forward purchase. You can go out to a wholesaler or a mill. Um, you know, as I talk to mills, there's not too many of them willing to go out and put a number on something forward. Some will, but most won't. You can go to a wholesaler and do it, and that's fine. Many, many have good relationships with customers and are willing to do that. Uh, so that has an upside to it. The downside is when you do that, you lose your own buying power to your mill. You can buy futures and take your basis risk, roll risk and time risk again. And if you're comfortable with that on many items, it works out great. On some items, if there's a very low correlation, you may want to go to the swap, as we said before, very specific, very, very specific to, uh, to items. All right, this, this next slide is gonna show a little bit about how custom a swap is and how very specific it is and how it may be different from other, other, other types of risk management. So a mill calls us or a customer calls us and they have a risk very specific that they wanna lock in on the buy side or the sell side. How does it work? They call us, I pick up the phone, they send me an email. We decide on an item that they want to use. And when I say an item, we go to an index. We look at a print price. So if you look at the first two pages of print, there's over 500 items on there, species, grades, widths, lengths. We pick an item out that they need to help manage the risk on. And we, we look at it and we say, OK, we're going to use this specific item. We agree on a start date. You can start next month. You can start six months from now if you want to. And we decided on a term. Right now, we currently go out 18 months. Uh, a volume, everything settles monthly for us in board footage. So again, they get the item, the start date, the term, and the volume. We put together a bid. We send that bid to the customer as a quote and say, hey, we can lock in this risk for you for this time period at this price. When I say negotiation and deal closure, a lot of times when people hear about a swap, they think, okay, they're gonna give me a number and that's the only number it is and I'm either gonna like it or I don't like it. This is where the negotiation comes in, into play. When we call a customer and we say, hey, how did our number look? And they say it was too high or it's too low. It gets a little tough to put business together that way. Um, but with our customers, what we usually do is we negotiate. If we say 400 on a price, and they need something close, we'll work and see if we can get it done. What we don't do is go to a, go a number so egregiously high or low that we can adjust at 20 or $30. Otherwise, the initial price that we give really is, is ir irrelevant. So we get a confirmation if we, we agree on this and we send over the deal. Um, and there's some paperwork involved in a swap because it is a over-the-counter swap and it has some, uh, some, some paperwork that needs to be put together. And then we agree on the settlement and we go to start working on the swap. So let's look at one here and how an inventory swap may actually work. So a customer calls us and they're able to buy a Great Lake 16 footers at a really cheap price relative to where, let's say, Prince trading at. They don't have it sold yet, but they want to figure out, so how do I go out and buy this inventory, put it on the ground and manage the risk? And they don't want to take the basis risk on it, so they go to us and they say, look, what will you buy a swap from us at for two months? And I'm only putting two months on this swap just because uh, of the space on here and, and, and just for the ease of showing you how it works. But this swap could also actualize over 18 months if you wanted to do that. So they, we say to them, all right, we'll give you $450 a thousand for that for that price, for that, that, for that specific item. Again, I'm putting that they bought here at 415. In most cases, I have no idea what they bought at. And it's probably a good thing they don't tell me. Um, so let's look at how the first month would actualize. So the first month, April 2017, and again, these are just hypothetical numbers. I'm just, just guessing at them. Let's say the index average 
the four weeks averaged at $460.75. So that's negative $10.75. The customer that bought that inventory and put it on the ground would send us a check for $4,730. That basically means they bought a 440,000 board feet of that item, four cars. When they go to sell that item, they're gonna be selling at a lot higher. So the money that they sent us versus the money that they sold higher to their customer brings the price back to $450 a thousand. Thus they lock in that price between 450 and 415. So the theory here is you buy it at 415, we, you sell every week according to what the print is. So you always have to be selling at print or better. If you sell it better, you get to keep all that premium yourself. If you sell less than print, that would go against where your swap is going to actualize at. We'll look at another scenario where the money flows a different way. May 2017 has four prints, and the average for that was $408.75. So you lost money selling the cash, right? It dropped, it dropped quite a bit. But because you had the swap sold to us at 450 it's a $41.25 profit on the swap side, or the 440,000 board feet you bought, you're gonna get a check for $18,000. Now you're selling cheaper in the cash market during that time frame, but the swap profit versus the loss you're taking on the cash side is gonna bring your, bring your sell price back to 450 bucks a thousand. So that's a simple look at an inventory hedge. Now let's look how it would actually actualize. This is basically showing you if you did nothing on a swap and you just looked at buying that 415 and selling every week, what your P&L would look like every single week. Let's just go back here a second. Now, while I was talking about the 450, 450 or 440,000 board feet, basically it's, I'm just saying it's a car a week. And again, you can... We can do this on trucks, we can do it on multiple volume, we can do it on small volumes. This chart shows the actual swap actualizing out for this whole contract, how the money would flow back and forth for each individual week of the swap, or each individual month of the swap settlement, but how it would look, how it would look weekly. And again, this kind of ties them all together showing your actual cash side, your swap side, and then your total P&L side. All right, let's flip our hats around here and go to the forward pricing side of it. You have a customer come to you and wants to lock in a long-term price on something. I'm going to only use two months again here. But let's say a customer came and they wanted you to sell them Boston studs, two by four, eight footers for, for two months. So your customer, you sell it to them at $420 a thousand. You go to us and you say, hey, what will you sell me two by four, eight foot Boston studs at for two months? So we go through the whole process that we talked about before we go back and we agree, well, we'll sell them to you at $410 a thousand. Okay. So April 2017 comes around again. There's four prints. The average index for the prints was $406.75. This time, the price is lower, so you would send us $1,430. On the physical side, you're buying cheaper from your mills, from your Boston mill, in theory. So that $3.25 brings you back to $410, and you lock in the $10 profit. Again, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I'm figuring you're going to build any freight or any other costs that you have associated into it yourself, but this is, this is just for sim simple purposes. May 2017 has four prints. So the in index average for the month is 424.25. Uh, minus 410, it's $14.25. We send you a check for $6,270. In the meantime, you're out buying your cash for more money. Hopefully you're buying it at or below print. If you're able to do that, it brings your price back to $410 a thousand. Again, we're going to go through it. This is just doing the cash side of the trade and how it would actualize out each week. There's when you add our $410 swap price protection. 
and this is actual actualization of the whole thing. Now, one of the benefits of the swap, we, like we said, we never get involved in your physical purchasing or your contacts with any of your customers. All our swap does is an overlay to help you manage some of your price risk. Uh, you get to keep all your buying and selling power internally and just use this as an overlay. So how is this innovative in the industry? Well, swaps have been used in the energy, in the foreign exchange, in the interest rate markets for years. We're just trying to bring them now into the lumber industry. And the way we brought them into the lumber industry is we've, met, we've done forest products for so long, pulp and paper. A lot of our mills said, hey, can you do lumber? So I think eight years ago, we started doing lumber. Um, and because there's so many different risks now and customers are asking us to do so much more and they're really trying to push risk downstream to all of us out here. This has really become uh, something that's taking off in our industry uh, quite a bit. It's half, half of our business now with KPPT. The other half is pulp and paper. Um, customized, you can see how the swap is completely different from a lot of other things. It's very custom and and can accommodate almost any item, time frame, or volume that you want to do. So if you're interested in talking a little bit further about it, we'd love to help you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thanks, Ashley. Phil. Stick around. There might, there might be a few <laughs> questions. Have you any questions for Ashley? Any, any questions? C'est un groupe euh, tranquille, certainement. Laurent. Sure. I, I, can, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. That was for the mics. Uh, it's for the records. Uh, okay. So I'm just in, uh, wondering who is buying. I, I, we understand that some mills will be selling. Who's buying on the other side? What kind of uh, clients is there? Sure. Sure. So, uh, what, so obviously on the sell side, we have we have mills that are selling yeah. easily. Um, on the buy side, um, we started out talking to home builders and other people, right? And what we noticed talking to home builders are like, we, we love your product, but we don't need to use it because we push all of our risk downstream and all the customers take it. So the people that downstream that use it are wholesalers, uh, multifamily use it because they have price risk out over 12 months. And I think as I said, and if I'm, I'm answering your question right here, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Uh, component manufacturers that have price risk on items, let's say for trusses. Trusses have 50% of their cost as lumber. They go out and sell multifamily for 12 months. They can't put 12 months inventory on the ground. They may buy some futures, but they may also have risk on certain items with low correlations like southern yellow pine or green dug fir, where they don't want to take that risk. And those are the type of customers that are buying for us from a long, for a long period of time. Well, thanks. Does that... Help. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, okay. that's, that's informative. And, and if I understand correctly, I guess if we see high lumber future prices or high print prices, we should look to go to somebody like you to kind of, if we're a producer, we go to you and possibly lock in some high prices for a long time. And I guess if you're a user, if you are a trust plant, if you're a mobile home manufacturer, when the prices are low on the prints, it's perhaps an opportunity to sure. lock in the Low prices for a long time. A question to you, and I don't mean it to be a trick question, but when you go to present like that, how does Coke make, make it profitable for them? What's, what's how do you, sure. uh, because yeah. it's not black magic. I mean, you, it has yeah, to yeah. be good for you as well. So kind of curious, uh, yeah, without going into no, the it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, most of the time when we're talking to a customer, and we're talking to one last night or a potential customer, like, how do you make your money, right? And the way we make our money, I think, as I said in the beginning, is so we take all this price risk into our own book of business. Like, we're not going out and somebody's not calling me and saying, I want to buy pine for the next 18 months. I pick up the phone and try to find somebody to back-to-back -back or wholesale it to. Just the market's not that deep, and that's why there's swaps. 
So we take our risk in our books. We have buy sides and we have sell sides in there for all different periods of time and volumes. So we may actually pick, take one buy on green dug fir and hedge it against a risk on southern yellow pine. We may outright go long and short different items. And we also use futures ourselves to manage some of the risk in our book. So between those three methods, we hope at the end of the year we were smart enough to figure out how to take all this business and make a little bit of money. And that's, that's kind of the secret sauce right there. <laughs> Thanks very much, yep, Ashley, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.